Chapter 33 The Modern Theory of Colonization Footnote We treat here of real colonies, virgin soils, colonized by free immigrants. The United States are, speaking economically, still only a colony of Europe. Besides, to this category belong such old plantations as those in which the abolition of slavery has completely altered the earlier conditions. End of footnote. Political economy confuses on principle two very different kinds of private property, of which one rests on the producer's own labour, the other on the employment of the labour of others. It forgets that the latter not only is the direct antithesis of the former, but absolutely grows on its tomb only. In Western Europe, the home of political economy, the process of primitive accumulation is more or less accomplished. Here, the capitalist regime has either directly conquered the whole domain of national production, or, where economic conditions are less developed, it at least indirectly controls those strata of society which, though belonging to the antiquated mode of production, continue to exist side by side with it in gradual decay. To this ready-made world of capital, the political economist applies the notions of law and of property inherited from a pre-capitalistic world with all the more anxious zeal and all the greater unction the more loudly the facts cry out in the face of his ideology. It is otherwise in the colonies. There the capitalist regime everywhere comes into collision with the resistance of the producer, who, as owner of his own conditions of labour, employs that labour to enrich himself, instead of the capitalist. The contradiction of these two diametrically opposed economic systems manifests itself here practically in a struggle between them. Where the capitalist has at his back the power of the mother country, he tries to clear out of his way by force the modes of production and appropriation based on the independent labour of the producer. The same interest which compels the sycophant of capital, the political economist, in the mother country to proclaim the theoretical identity of the capitalist mode of production with its contrary, that same interest compels him in the colonies to make a clean breast of it and to proclaim aloud the antagonism of the two modes of production. To this end, he proves how the development of the social productive power of labour, cooperation, division of labour, use of machinery on a large scale, etc., are impossible without the expropriation of the labourers and the corresponding transformation of their means of production into capital. In the interest of the so-called national wealth, he seeks for artificial means to ensure the poverty of the people. Here his apologetic armour crumbles off bit by bit like rotten touchwood. It is the great merit of E. G. Wakefield to have discovered not anything new about the colonies, but to have discovered in the colonies the truth as to the conditions of capitalist production in the mother country. As the system of protection at its origin, later it became a temporary necessity in the international competitive struggle, but whatever its motive, the consequences remain the same, attempted to manufacture capitalists artificially in the mother country, so Wakefield's colonisation theory, which England tried for a time to enforce by Acts of Parliament, attempted to effect the manufacture of wage workers in the colonies. This he calls systematic colonisation. Footnote. Wakefield's few glimpses on the subject of modern colonisation are fully anticipated by Mirabeau Père, the physiocrat, and even much earlier by English economists. End of footnote. First of all, Wakefield discovered that in the colonies, property in money, means of subsistence, machines, and other means of production, does not as yet stamp a man as a capitalist if there be wanting the correlative, the wage worker, the other man who is compelled to sell himself 
of his own free will. He discovered that capital is not a thing, but a social relation between persons, established by the instrumentality of things. Footnote. A negro is a negro. In certain circumstances, he becomes a slave. A mule is a machine for spinning cotton. Only under certain circumstances does it become capital. Outside these circumstances, it is no more capital than gold is intrinsically money, or sugar is the price of sugar. Capital is a social relation of production. It is a historical relation of production. Karl Marx, Lohnarbeit und Kapital, 1849 End of footnote Mr. Peel, he moans, took with him from England to Swan River, West Australia, means of subsistence and of production to the amount of fifty thousand pounds. Mr. Peel had the foresight to bring with him, besides, three hundred persons of the working class, men, women, and children. Once arrived at his destination, Mr. Peel was left without a servant to make his bed or fetch him water from the river. Footnote, e.g. Wakefield, England and America. End of footnote. Unhappy Mr. Peel, who provided for everything except the export of English modes of production to Swan River. For the understanding of the following discoveries of Wakefield, two preliminary remarks. We know that the means of production and subsistence, while they remain the property of the immediate producer, are not capital. They become capital only under circumstances in which they serve at the same time as means of exploitation and subjection of the labourer. But this capitalist soul of theirs is so intimately wedded in the head of the political economist to their material substance that he christens them capital under all circumstances, even when they are its exact opposite. Thus is it with Wakefield. Further, the splitting up of the means of production into the individual property of many independent labourers working on their own account he calls equal division of capital. It is with the political economist as with the feudal jurist. The latter stuck on to pure monetary relations the labels supplied by feudal law. If, says Wakefield, all members of the society are supposed to possess equal portions of capital, no man would have a motive for accumulating more capital than he could use with his own hands. This is to some extent the case in new American settlements, where a passion for owning land prevents the existence of a class of labourers for hire. So long, therefore, as the labourer can accumulate for himself, and this he can do, so long as he remains possessor of his means of production, capitalist accumulation and the capitalistic mode of production are impossible. The class of wage labourers essential to these is wanting. How, then, in old Europe, was the expropriation of the labourer from his conditions of labour, that is, the coexistence of capital and wage labour, brought about? by a social contract of a quite original kind. Mankind have adopted a simple contrivance for promoting the accumulation of capital, which, of course, since the time of Adam, floated in their imagination, floated in their imagination as the sole and final end of their existence. They have divided themselves into owners of capital and owners of labour. The division was the result of concert and combination. In one word, the mass of mankind expropriated itself in honour of the accumulation of capital. Now, one would think that this instinct of self-denying fanaticism would give itself full fling, especially in the colonies, where alone exist the men and conditions that could turn a social contract from a dream to a reality. But why, then, should systematic colonization be called in to replace its opposite, spontaneous, unregulated colonization? 
but, but, in the northern states of the American Union, it may be doubted whether so many as a tenth of the people would fall under the description of hired labourers. In England, the labouring class composed the bulk of the people. Nay, the impulse to self-expropriation on the part of labouring humanity for the glory of capital exists so little that slavery, according to Wakefield himself, is the sole natural basis of colonial wealth. His systematic colonization is a mere pis aller, last resort, since he unfortunately has to do with free men, not with slaves. The first Spanish settlers in San Domingo did not obtain labourers from Spain, but without labourers their capital must have perished, or at least must soon have been diminished to that small amount which each individual could employ with his own hands. This has actually occurred in the last colony founded by England, the Swan River Settlement, where a great mass of capital, of seeds, implements and cattle, has perished for want of labourers to use it, and where no settler has preserved much more capital than he can employ with his own hands. We have seen that the expropriation of the mass of the people from the soil forms the basis of the capitalist mode of production. The essence of a free colony, on the contrary, consists in this, that the bulk of the soil is still public property, and every settler on it therefore can turn part of it into his private property and individual means of production, without hindering the later settlers in the same operation. Footnote. Land, to be an element of colonization, must not only be waste, but it must be public property, liable to be converted into private property. End of footnote. This is the secret both of the prosperity of the colonies and of their inveterate vice, opposition to the establishment of capital. Where land is very cheap and all men are free, where everyone who so pleases can easily obtain a piece of land for himself, not only is labour very dear, as respects the labourer's share of the produce, but the difficulty is to obtain combined labour at any price. As in the colonies, the separation of the labourer from the conditions of labour and their root, the soil, does not exist, or only sporadically, or on too limited a scale. So neither does the separation of agriculture from industry exist, nor the destruction of the household industry of the peasantry. Whence, then, is to come the internal market for capital? No part of the population of America is exclusively agricultural, excepting slaves and their employers who combine capital and labor in particular works. Free Americans, who cultivate the soil, follow many other occupations. Some portion of the furniture and tools which they use is commonly made by themselves. They frequently build their own houses and carry to market, at whatever distance, the produce of their own industry. They are spinners and weavers. They make soap and candles, as well as, in many cases, shoes and clothes for their own use. In America, the cultivation of land is often the secondary pursuit of a blacksmith, a miller or a shopkeeper. With such queer people as these, where is the field of abstinence for the capitalists? The great beauty of capitalist production consists in this, that it not only constantly reproduces the wage worker as wage worker, but produces always, in proportion to the accumulation of capital, a relative surplus population of wage workers. Thus, the law of supply and demand of labor is kept in the right rut. The oscillation of wages is penned within limits satisfactory to capitalist exploitation. And lastly, the social dependence of the labor on the capitalist, that indispensable requisite, is secured. An unmistakable relation of dependence 
which the smug political economist at home in the mother country can transmogrify into one of free contract between buyer and seller, between equally independent owners of commodities, the owner of the commodity capital and the owner of the commodity labour. But in the colonies, this pretty fancy is torn asunder. The absolute population here increases much more quickly than in the mother country, because many labourers enter this world as ready-made adults, and yet the labour market is always understocked. The law of supply and demand of labour falls to pieces. On the one hand, the old world constantly throws in capital, thirsting after exploitation and abstinence. On the other, the regular reproduction of the wage labourer as wage labourer comes into collision with impediments the most impertinent and in part invincible. What becomes of the production of wage labourers, supernumerary in proportion to the accumulation of capital? The wage worker of today is tomorrow an independent peasant or artisan working for himself. He vanishes from the labour market but not into the workhouse. This constant transformation of the wage labourers into independent producers who work for themselves instead of for capital and enrich themselves instead of the capitalist gentry reacts in its turn very perversely on the conditions of the labour market. Not only does the degree of exploitation of the wage labourer remain indecently low, the wage labourer loses into the bargain, along with the relation of dependence, also the sentiment of dependence on the abstemious capitalist. Hence all the inconveniences that our E.G. Wakefield pictures so doughtily, so eloquently, so pathetically. The supply of wage labour, he complains, is neither constant, nor regular, nor sufficient. The supply of labour is always not only small but uncertain. Though the produce divided between the capitalist and the labourer be large, the labourer takes so great a share that he soon becomes a capitalist. Few, even those whose lives are unusually long, can accumulate great masses of wealth. The labourers most distinctly decline to allow the capitalist to abstain from the payment of the greater part of their labour. It avails him nothing if he is so cunning as to import from Europe with his own capital his own wage workers. They soon cease to be labourers for hire, they become independent landowners, if not competitors with their former masters in the labour market. Think of the horror! The excellent capitalist has imported bodily from Europe with his own good money, his own competitors. The end of the world has come. No wonder Wakefield laments the absence of all dependence and of all sentiment of dependence on the part of the wage workers in the colonies. On account of the high wages, says his disciple Merivale, there is in the colonies the urgent desire for cheaper and more subservient labourers, for a class to whom the capitalist might dictate terms instead of being dictated to by them. In ancient civilised countries, the labourer, though free, is by law of nature dependent on capitalists. In colonies, this dependence must be created by artificial means. Footnote. Merivale. Even the mild, free-trade, vulgar economist Molinari says, In the colonies where slavery has been abolished without the compulsory labour being replaced with an equivalent quantity of free labour, there has occurred the opposite of what happens every day before our eyes. Simple workers have been seen to exploit in their turn the industrial entrepreneurs, demanding from them wages which bear absolutely no relation to the legitimate share in the product which they ought to receive. The planters were unable to obtain for their sugar for a sufficient price to cover the increase in wages, 
and were obliged to furnish the extra amount at first out of their profits and then out of their very capital. A considerable amount of planters have been ruined as a result, while others have closed down their businesses in order to avoid the ruin which threatened them. It is doubtless better that these accumulations of capital should be destroyed than that generations of men should perish. How generous, Mr. Molinari! But would it not be better if both survived? Molinari. Mr. Molinari, Mr. Molinari. What then becomes of the Ten Commandments, of Moses and the Prophets, of the law of supply and demand, if in Europe the entrepreneur can cut down the labourer's legitimate part, and in the West Indies the labourer can cut down the entrepreneur's? And what, if you please, is this legitimate part, which on your own showing the capitalist in Europe daily neglects to pay? Over yonder in the colonies where the labourers are so simple as to exploit the capitalist, Mr. Molinari feels a strong itching to set the law of supply and demand that works elsewhere automatically on the right road by means of the police. End of footnote. What is now, according to Wakefield, the consequence of this unfortunate state of things in the colonies? A barbarizing tendency of dispersion of producers and national wealth. The parceling out of the means of production among innumerable owners working on their own account annihilates, along with the centralization of capital, all the foundation of combined labour. Every long-winded undertaking extending over several years and demanding outlay of fixed capital is prevented from being carried out. In Europe, capital invests without hesitating a moment, for the working class constitutes its living appurtenance, always in excess, always at disposal. But in the colonies... Wakefield tells an extremely doleful anecdote. He was talking with some capitalists of Canada and the state of New York, where the immigrant wave often becomes stagnant and deposits a sediment of supernumerary labourers. Our capital, says one of the characters in the melodrama, was ready for many operations which require a considerable period of time for their completion, but we could not begin such operations with labour which we knew would soon leave us. If we had been sure of retaining the labour of such emigrants, we should have been glad to have engaged it at once, and for a high price, and we should have engaged it even though we had been sure it would leave us, provided we had been sure of a fresh supply whenever we might need it. After Wakefield has constructed the English capitalist agriculture and its combined labour with the scattered cultivation of American peasants, he unwittingly gives us a glimpse at the reverse of the medal. He depicts the mass of the American people as well-to-do, independent, enterprising, and comparatively cultured, whilst the English agricultural labourer is a miserable wretch, a pauper. In what country, except North America and some new colonies, do the wages of free labour employed in agriculture much exceed a bare subsistence for the labourer? Undoubtedly, farm horses in England, being a valuable property, are better fed than English peasants. But never mind. National wealth is, once again, by its very nature, identical with misery of the people. How, then, to heal the anti-capitalistic cancer of the colonies? If men were willing at a blow to turn all the soil from public into private property, they would destroy certainly the root of the evil, but also the colonies. The trick is how to kill two birds with one stone— let the government put upon the virgin soil an artificial price, independent of the law of supply and demand, a price that compels the immigrant to work a long time for wages, 
before he can earn enough money to buy land and turn himself into an independent peasant. Footnote. It is, you add, a result of the appropriation of the soil and of capital that the man who has nothing but the strength of his arms finds employment and creates an income for himself. But the opposite is true. It is thanks to the individual appropriation of the soil that there exist men who only possess the strength of their arms. When you put a man in a vacuum, you rob him of the air. You do the same when you take away the soil from him, for you are putting him in a space void of wealth, so as to leave him no way of living except according to your wishes. Collins. End of footnote. The fund resulting from the sale of land at a price relatively prohibitory for the wage workers, this fund of money extorted from the wages of labour by violation of the sacred law of supply and demand, the government is to employ, on the other hand, in proportion as it grows, to import have-nothings from Europe into the colonies, and thus keep the wage labour market full for the capitalists. Under these circumstances, everything will be for the best in the best of all possible worlds. This is the great secret of systematic colonization. By this plan, Wakefield cries in triumph, the supply of labour must be constant and regular, because, first, as no labourer would be able to procure land until he had worked for money, all immigrant labourers, working for a time for wages and in combination, would produce capital for the employment of more labourers. Secondly, because every labourer who left off working for wages and became a landowner would, by purchasing land, provide a fund for bringing fresh labour to the colony. The price of soil imposed by the state must, of course, be a sufficient price, that is, so high as to prevent the labourers from becoming independent landowners until others had followed to take their place. This sufficient price for the land is nothing but a euphemistic circumlocution for the ransom which the labourer pays to the capitalist for leave to retire from the wage labour market to the land. First he must create for the capitalist capital, with which the latter may be able to exploit more labourers. Then he must place, at his own expense, a locum tenens, placeholder on the labour market, whom the government forwards across the sea for the benefit of his old master, the capitalist. It is very characteristic that the English government for years practised this method of primitive accumulation prescribed by Mr. Wakefield expressly for the use of the colonies. The fiasco was, of course, as complete as that of Sir Robert Peel's Bank Act. The stream of emigration was only diverted from the English colonies to the United States. Meanwhile, the advance of capitalistic production in Europe, accompanied by increasing government pressure, has rendered Wakefield's recipe superfluous. On the one hand, the enormous and ceaseless stream of men year after year driven upon America leaves behind a stationary sediment in the east of the United States, the wave of immigration from Europe throwing men on the labour market there more rapidly than the wave of emigration westwards can wash them away. On the other hand, the American Civil War brought in its train a colossal national debt, and with it, pressure of taxes, the rise of the vilest financial aristocracy, the squandering of a huge part of the public land on speculative companies for the exploitation of railways, mines, etc. In brief, the most rapid centralization of capital. The Great Republic has, therefore, ceased to be the promised land for emigrant laborers. Capitalistic production advances there with giant strides, even though the lowering of wages and the dependence of the wage worker are yet far from being brought down to the normal European level. 
the shameless lavishing of uncultivated colonial land on aristocrats and capitalists by the government, so loudly denounced even by Wakefield, has produced, especially in Australia in conjunction with the stream of men that the gold diggings attract and with the competition that the importation of English commodities causes even to the smallest artisan, an ample relative surplus labouring population, so that almost every male brings the Job's news of a glut of the Australia labour market, and the prostitution in some places flourishes as wantonly as in the London hay market. Footnote. As soon as Australia became her own lawgiver, she passed, of course, laws favourable to the settlers, but the squandering of the land already accomplished by the English government stands in the way. The first and main object at which New Land Act of 1862 aims is to give increased facilities for the settlement of the people. The Land Law of Victoria by the Honourable C. G. Duffy, Minister of Public Lands, London, 1862. End of footnote. However, we are not concerned here with the conditions of the colonies. The only thing that interests us is the secret discovered in the new world by the political economy of the old world and proclaimed on the housetops that the capitalist mode of production and accumulation and therefore capitalist private property have for their fundamental condition the annihilation of self-earned private property, in other words, the expropriation of the labourer.